Uh, thank you very much, Hans, that, for that introduction. Um, by the way, I, I have this Turkish brand energy drink inside of me, so I'm kind of tweaking a little bit between that and the jet lag and my normal New York way of talking. I hope I don't speak too quickly or have the concept of how quickly I am speaking. Uh, I'm also the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il. And today I'll be speaking as quickly as I can about North Korea because we have a lot to cover. Um, when I first started this project, the thing I wanted to change was how North Korea is regarded so often as a bit of a carnival. And for the people in this room who understand totalitarian regimes, they realize perfectly well that the carnival atmosphere is exactly the last thing you're thinking of. You're thinking of you know, atrocity, death, and uh, constant oppression. Uh, Ayn Rand once wrote that, um, I'm going to paraphrase it because I always get it incorrect, errors of this magnitude are never made innocently. And it has been a very long, decades-long process for the Kim regime to turn North Korea into the worst country on Earth by several objective criteria. This was not done accidentally. This was done very intentionally um, and, and carefully. And they've dug themselves into a corner very well uh, that will take a lot of work to extricate from. So uh, as many of you know, North Korea has the world's worst record when it comes to the press. There were a couple of years where Eritrea kind of caught up with them, but now they've regained that first prize. And as a result of this, for many years, the North Korean population was unaware of history because there was no information allowed from the outside world by law. So let me explain a little bit of North Korean history and what they're taught as North Korean history. Uh, briefly, you know, North Korea, Korea was conquered by Japan before uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, the Japanese built infrastructure in their colony, infrastructure that's used to this day. Um, but according to, and these were the people who teamed up with Hitler, let's not forget. So the Japanese of the early 1900s are not the Japanese of today. Although according to North Korea, that certainly is not true because as they put it, the sons of samurai do not easily give up their dreams of world domination. Um, but according to them, you know, there were every so often there were uprisings and, and rebellions. But according to North Korean mythology, but for a leader, the masses without a leader, there's no point. So you need to have a leader to have a revolution. They're much more explicit about this than textbook Marxists and people from other uh, countries. And that leader, of course, was the man that they called the great leader, right here, uh, Kim Il-sung. Um, according to North Korean propaganda, uh, Korea, and they always refer to it as Korea, so North and South are lowercase n and lowercase s. Uh, Korea was the first government on Earth. Korean was the first language spoken on Earth. Uh, Korea is where civilization originated. Um, and they um, recently found bones that they claim that, that prove this, demonstrably false. And Korea is the for only country on Earth that is racially homogenous. Uh, this is something they say, look, we're the only ones maintaining racial purity. Every other country is some sort of admixture, whether through conquest, conquest or intermarriage. And this is a big criticism they have of South Korea, that they're keeping the Korean racial bloodline pure, whereas uh, South Korea is, depending on the propaganda of the year, uh, US-occupied territory that's being used to give people AIDS and, and uh, experiment on so and so forth. Um, Come World War I, of course, uh, when the Japanese you know, ran Korea, they tried to eliminate Korean as a spoken language. They encouraged uh, the Korean populace to take Japanese names, so on and so forth. Uh, with World War I, uh, obviously, uh, Japanese were defeated. But according to North Koreans, it wasn't the Americans who defeated the Japanese. It was Kim Il-sung and his guerrilla army. Uh, they don't refer to it as World War, II. World War II, they refer to it as the Pacific War. And this was his great accomplishment that this you know, man with his ragtag bad, bang, um, band of comrades got to drive out the evil Japanese uh, and liberate Korea for, you know, after decades of uh, evil oppression. Uh, by law, and it's very funny, when I was doing research for my book, they will, by law, they have to use slurs when they refer to the Japanese or to Americans. So you read a, you know, a history and they'll talk about, oh, in 1932, the wicked Jap devils, blah, 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 blah. And it's very, very jarring you know, to read this because otherwise the tone is perfectly you know, erudite. And in fact, I was on Fox once and I referred to how they talk about the Jap bastards and I got bleeped and was never asked back to that show, even though I was just quoting from the literature. Um, 
After World War II, as we know, one of the things that they complain about with some fairness is that Korea was not a combatant in World War II, and the only two nations who were severed in half were Germany and Korea. So what, what happened is, you know, Russia had their field of influence, the United States had their field of influence, the United States wanted Seoul, the capital of Korea, uh, and basically they just drew a line at the 30th parallel directly north of Seoul. Uh, the Americans got the southern half, the, uh, the Russians got the northern half, and again, Korea's like, look, we were indivisible for millennia, and now Korea is rent in two for reasons that are completely uh, foreign to us. Um, come the US installed, and as we do to this day, we installed a strong man who would be partial to our interests in the South, named Sigmund Rhee, who was not particularly loved or a member of the uh, South Korean population. Again, according to the North Korean propaganda, it was not Seoul, but Pyongyang, which was the historical capital of North Korea, and Pyongyang became the capital. Uh, the USSR installed um, Kim Il-sung, who was not a particularly good uh, Korean speaker, and had, we did not have much cachet in the Korean population at all. He declared himself and his government, the government of all the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Sigmund Rhee declared government, the government of the whole Korean Peninsula, and now you had dueling governments over one nation, and things came to a head with the, when, Sig, when uh, Kim Il-sung got permission from Stalin uh, to launch the Korean War. However, according to their propaganda and according to a book that is published in North Korea, the U.S. imperialists started the Korean War. And it's been described as akin to finding out that uh, FDR hit the Japanese at Pearl Harbor when refugees learned that, in fact, it was uh, Kim Il-sung who launched the Korean War. Now, the Korean War, as I'm sure most of these people in this room know, was a horribly brutal exercise. You had the North uh, with Russia in, in their back, and, and later the and Russians and the Chinese. In the South, you had South Koreans with the US and the UN. Uh, the, the war went back. You know, the, At one point, the North, with their first invasion, had 95% of the Korean uh, peninsula under their control. Then we came back. Then, then things eventually came to a stalemate. But as a consequence of this stalemate, much of the Korean Peninsula saw death and destruction on an enormous scale. This is very much still a part of their national mythology because their argument is the US imperialists, that's me, uh, have been waiting to make Korea a beachhead for their plan for world domination since at least the 1860s. And in fact, in the 1860s, the US was the first Western country to visit Korea. We sent USS General Sherman there and the Koreans, which were always been very xenophobic, uh, killed everyone on board the USS General Sherman and sunk it to the bottom of the Taedong River that still runs through Pyongyang to this day. That part is true. The fact that the people who did this were the direct ancestors of the great leader Kim Il-sung, that part's not really true. Um, but they do very much want to have this sort of lineage uh, and, and, and this sort of bloodline is very, very key to their thinking. Uh, with the end of the Korean War and, and the stalemate, as everyone I'm sure knows, there was an armistice Stein. Technically, the North and the South are still at war. Um, with the death of Stalin and the rise of Khrushchev, in, in 56, Khrushchev gave his secret speech where he denounced Stalinism and the cult of personality. And one by one, all the nations in the Second World and the Soviet sphere followed suit, but for North Korea. So Kim Il-sung th thought this was absolutely the wrong way to go. Uh, what he did is he left, he passed a law, and this is only discovered you know, in, the, in, the, in the last, let's say, 20 years. He passed a law that if anyone was visiting any embassy, like they had to you know, kind of sign in somewhere. He left the country, and while he left, he figured out who was talking to the foreigners. And then they had a, this big plenum for, the, for the, uh, the party, and he sat his allies next to people he were suspicious of. So when they started to get up and try to denounce some sort of personality cult, the others literally got up and outshouted them. And very quickly, those who would have been in the middle followed suit because they could see which way the wind was blowing. Uh, the people who were somewhat disloyal to Kim Il-sung were sent to the countryside, not necessarily always to concentration camps. Sometimes they were just sent to be farmers, which is still quite a punishment if you come from the ruling elite. Now you have to be a dirt farmer for the rest of your life. And very, very quickly, he started to increase his control over the whole country. He made it illegal to kind of study abroad, banned foreign publications. Uh, e even things like Marx were banned because now we don't, we don't need Marx. We have the great leader, uh, Kim Il-sung. He closed the borders. And, and basically, uh, the term Hermit Kingdom is often used vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. It's you, it's, he was basically trying to hermetically seal the nation as much as possible. And he did a very, very 
a good job of it. And he was also inspiring Ceausescu from Romania, who was widely regarded as uh, the worst of the communist dictators, went to North Korea, was like, hey, I, I, and, and befriended Kim Il-sung, was like, I like what this guy's doing. And, and he followed suit in many, many ways in Romania, which much to the detriment, of course, to the North Korean, uh, to, excuse me, to the Romanian population. So very quickly, you had the concentration camps. You had uh, you know, typical communist control. It very, it's described as Stalinist, but it went into another, uh, even darker direction. Um, because things like, under Stalin, we had the show trials, right? You had, there was some pretense of law. That does not really exist in North Korea to this day. Uh, the great leader Kim Il-sung said, class enemies must be exterminated to three generations. So what that means today in North Korea, if someone commits a crime, three generations of your family are punished for it. This is a very effective method of social control. And it's not like there's a trial, there's a knock at the door. The whole family is you know, um, exiled to the countryside or to the concentration camps. And you don't know who got you sent there. So you know, these camps that to this day have 100 to 300,000 people, you can see the camps on Google Earth. Uh, you're sent, you don't know who the, 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 the one who sent you there, you don't know what your crime is. And bizarrely, these camps are not always a death sentence because sometimes families are sent for a finite period of time. They basically have to sign a non-disclosure agreement and then after a certain amount of time, after they've worked their, their sins away, they're allowed back to the North Korean population. In, in the 60s, uh, Kim Il-sung's um, son, Kim Jong-il, the, the later who became known very famously as the dear leader, he was head of the propaganda and agitation department. And the goal of the Propaganda Agitation Department, of course, is to teach the North Koreans the correct way of looking at life and history. And he and his uncle competed for the successorship, which is completely against, of course, Marxist ideology. And he's decided that you know all movies have to be about the great leader Kim Il-sung's exploits, and all books have to be about him, and it has to be about the, the revolution. And the monotony of this kind of literature and, and, and cinema is, uh, is, I'm sure, not lost on people in this room. But it has to be what they call the Juche idea. This is Kim, great leader Kim Il-sung's revolutionary philosophy. The Juche idea means um, you know, by us and for us. You know, it has to be from Koreans and for Koreans. It, that's what the theory is. In practice, it just means that which I like. So there is an Arc de Triomphe in, in Pyongyang, which looks exactly like the one in Paris, but it's a, foot, it's a meter taller and therefore better. Uh, but it's not at all inspired by the one in Paris. It's actually inspired by a medieval Korean gate. And they have uh, the Tower of Juche Idea, which looks exactly like the Washington Monument with a, with a flame on top. But it wasn't inspired by the at all. It was actually inspired by some medieval Korean, you know, what have you. So this is their claim that anything in this country has to be from this country, which to this day leads to horrible consequences because then you're not going to have much medicine. You're not going to have you know, uh, prophylactics or uh, the very things that are kind of uh, often counterintuitive. Uh, so the two of them, uh, Kim Jong-il and his uncle, had this big rivalry to see who could glorify the great leader Kim Il-sung even, even more. They built a gigantic statue for him in Pyongyang, uh, which is, I think, like six stories, it's something insane. Everyone who goes to visit, you have to go there, you have to bow before it. Uh, it was plated in gold. There's this big idea that the Chinese and the North Koreans agree on everything. The Chinese said to them, you know, this was in the early 70s, we're communists, maybe a giant gold-plated icon is not really what we're about. And they said, correct, so they changed it to bronze. Um, uh, other things that, that Kim Jong-il implemented is why I have this shirt. Everyone by law in North Korea has to wear a badge of one of the two leaders whenever they leave the home, even the children. Uh, when you're in the airport in Beijing and you see the stewardesses and the, and the people working the with them, it's a very surreal moment. Everyone by law in their house has to have one wall with just the photos of the two leaders and the glass is at an angle that's slanted and you have to keep it dusted and they come in and inspect it every so often. So there's this extreme sense of religious iconography. Uh, if you read their press, there'll be stories which is far beyond things even for fundamental Christians. There are these stories where uh, there's a fire in your house and someone saves the pictures on the wall, but they themselves die in the process and this is regarded as heroic. I can't think of anyone from any religion being like, well, there's a Bible, but my house is on fire. You know, there, any Christian would say, leave the Bible, just go and save yourself. So it's, it's very, very weird um, in that uh, regard. This is the only country where you can't really use the stamps 
because the stamps have the leaders and you can't kind of uh, have anything marked on them. So it's, it's unique in that sense for uh, stamp collecting. Other things that they did, they borrowed from the Japanese, the, excuse me, the Chinese, the, the idea of struggle sessions, although they call them the sessions on revolutionary life or uh, criticism and self-criticism. So by law, everyone in North Korea, once a week, has to get together with their group, whatever it is, their classroom or their um, neighborhood or something like that, and it would be like this, and I would have to get up and say what I did wrong that week, and then I have to point out what I saw other people doing wrong. So I saw Hans being late for class, and he cheated on his homework. And then Hans would say, well, you know, this, now they collaborate. So Hans would be like, hey, say I was late, and you'll say, okay, I, I stole a pencil. Okay, good, we got it. Uh, because you have to have something to say. So you have an entire nation of people who are publicly spying on each other and declaring they're spying. So the idea that people are going to collude and have some sort of revolution has been rendered pretty much utterly um, impossible. Uh, with, and and uh, let me tell some highlights of North Korean history. In, in 1968, they captured USS Pueblo with the crew that was on board. Uh, they kept the men you know, fairly well at first. And then they were taking a photo of them for uh, Time Magazine. And the men sat, took for the pictures with their middle finger outstretched. And they asked, the North Koreans asked them, what does that middle finger mean? And they said, oh, it's a Hawaiian good luck charm. Uh, and then they wrote a letter of, you know, that's saying they were treating well. And they, they said, we, P-E-A-E-N, peon, it's pronounced in English. So it's like, we peon Kim Il-sung, we peon North Korea. It looks fine uh, reading it. If you Dictionary, when the North Koreans figured out the trick, the men were subject to the most unbelievable torture imaginable. So back and forth, the argument came in 68 between uh, the North Koreans say, admit you're spying on us and apologize. The Americans refused to do this. They said, admit you're spying on us and apologize. The Americans refused to do this. And when I was doing the research for the book, so many of the stories that I'd read seemed so bizarre. And then I did the homework. I'm like, no, it's even crazier than you think. So then some American genius, and I'm not being sarcastic, had the idea, goes, hey, what if we apologize in writing, but as we're signing the document, we say the document's a lie. And the North Koreans go, oh yeah, that's fine. So literally, at the ceremony to free the Americans in 1968, the Americans said, uh, you know, this statement is at variance with the facts, and anything that is at variance with the facts is not true. I only say this to free our soldiers, and he signed it. The guys were sent home, and the Pyongyang, uh, the Pueblo, and that letter are still in display in North Korea, it's the only American ship that is not under American control. And it's supposedly moored exactly where the USS General Sherman was shot down in, uh, was burned to the ground in the 1860s. Um, in the middle, in the late 70s, there were, there's the DMZ, which famously divides the two Koreas. Uh, despite being called a demilitarized zone, it is the most uh, heavily militarized border on Earth. And there was this big tree. And the Americans came to chop it down because it was blocking their view of North Korea. They didn't ask for permission. The North Koreans took the axe and chopped up the American soldiers. That bloody axe is still on display in North Korea. I saw with my own eyes. And the Americans, with typical American Americanism, launched Operation Paul Bunyan after the legendary uh, um, uh, uh, lumberjack. And they brought all these ships and helicopters. And they, didn't, they, they took that tree and they reduced it to a stump not entirely so that the North Koreans can see the force of the American arms. Uh, in the early 80s, Kim Jong-il was officially declared as the successor to the great leader Kim Il-sung, which threw the communist world into a tailspin. The idea of some kind of hereditary successorship was just complete anathema to them. And what I found, which was fascinating, is every criticism of North Korea, North Korea has a response to. Uh, sometimes those responses are horrific. and in a very darkly humorous way. For example, when the UN recently attacked them for their concentration camps and human rights abuses, their literal response is, we don't use the term concentration camps, so therefore we don't have any. Um, and in the same way that they have Juche architecture and Juche sports, they say, well, well, our definition of human rights is national sovereignty, so when you criticize our nation, you're violating our human rights. Now, how are you going to respond to a country that does not negotiate in good faith? That's the question that the world has been grappling with for many decades. Um, and the question was, how are you going to have someone hand over the leadership to their son? Well, their argument goes, look, uh, Stalin gave way to Khrushchev, and he ruined the whole revolution. So only someone who is a, as much of a successor as the predecessor can carry the revolution through to the generations until the very end. Um, in the 80s, uh, Seoul, you know, North Korea and South Korea were still not member states of the UN. China was blocking South Korea being allowed into uh, the UN. At one point, Seoul was granted the Summer Olympics. 
And Kim Jong-il got on the phone. He goes, hey, wouldn't it be great if we shared the Olympics? You know, this would be a great sign of Korean unity. You know, national uh, um, uh, reunification is something we both want. And Seoul said, well, you don't have the facilities, number one. Number two is the, UN, the, the Olympic Committee granted us to us, not to both of us. And they granted to a city, not to a country. And Kim Jong-il said, come on. And they go, we, we can't do this, we're not interested. He goes, come on, he goes, okay. So what did Kim Jong-il do? So he got two spies and they boarded a plane in uh, Europe and they put a bomb safely in their overhead compartment and they got off in Bahrain at the layover and that plane blew up us uh, uh, and killed many, many people on board. Um, which is why the North Koreans were on the state-sponsored terrorism list until fairly recently. Uh, and as a result of this, you know, this was their t attempt to, to kind of ruin the South Korean Olympics. And as a consequence, he launched his own Communist Olympics, the People's Festival of Freedom, and, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the acme of the North Korean uh, experiment. After that, you had the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union would subsidize North Korea and China would as well. Kim Il-sung was great at playing them against each other. I'm trying to, oh, I'm running out of time. Wow, okay, we're not gonna, okay. Um, what they would do is the Russians would send the North Koreans oil and the North Koreans would send the Russians like crappy socks and they would call it a friendship crisis and they say it's a wash. As, a, as after uh, the USSR fell, there was nothing the North Koreans had that the Russians wanted or that any other country wanted. And it was an exact inversion of, Henry ha of, of um, Leonard Reed's eye pencil. Because what happened was, without oil, you couldn't run the factories. Without the factories, you couldn't produce fertilizer. Without fertilizer, you can't grow crops in an extremely mountainous country. Uh, the North Koreans launched a campaign called, let's eat two meals a day instead of three because having three meals a day is unhealthy, so this was a good thing that there wasn't much food. Uh, the great leader Kim Il-sung died and Kim Jong-il took over, and perhaps being the most honest politician on earth, his campaign slogan actually was, do not expect any change from me. <laughs> but there was change, and it was what they called the arduous march, because without food, people started eating grass, then they started eating bark, then they started eating weeds, and it got to the point where they were eating saccharin just to have some food in their bellies. And this, the twisted part of this regime is those who were faithful were the first ones to starve because they thought the dear leader is gonna take care of us, food is right around the corner. You had one to two million people starve in North Korea. This was very much an intentional genocide. Kim Jong-il said having too many people makes socialism difficult. And he said explicitly, uh, if we allow the UN to bring in food, then the government's gonna be superfluous. So as the population of North Korea you know, descended into uh, uh, hunger, you had mass diseases coming back. They even had polio return uh, in the 90s. And of course, this was all the fault of the US imperialists. Uh, what, when the UN came, they were not allowed to have any Korean speakers on, on their staff. And they would take them to village A on Monday and they showed them some healthy people and they took them to village B on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, they went back to village A. And when the UN said, we were just here Monday, they were said, no, you weren't. And the UN eventually left, and, and that's how dark things have gone. That's why North Korea opened themselves up to tourism in exchange to try to get hard currency. And I totally misunderestimated how much time I have, but let me try to get things through as quickly as possible. Now, North Korea, like most of these communist states, have a uh, constitution, which is, in this case, for display purposes only. North Korea is actually governed by the Ten Commandments of the great leader Kim Il-sung, the tenth of which says, the revolution shall be continued through the generations until the end. What that means in practice is only a blood descendant of the great leader Kim Il-sung can be leader. So very recently, when Kim Jong-un took over for his father Kim Jong-il, he murdered his elder brother Kim Jong-nam in that Malaysian airport because there, now there's no Mike Pence. Now there's no one to take over. This is an insurance policy. Uh, and people often ask, you know, why can't you have a military coup? Because there's no precedent for any other, so any person to be in charge other than the leader. And there is a sense of divinity about the leadership. It's not in the same way as there being a god, but I guess the, a good parallel would be how Americans think of Uncle Sam, this kind of mythical figure that travels around and, um, and solves problems. I, when I was doing the research for the book, uh, the, the fables are extremely monotonous. Um, I'll tell you a couple of, of anecdotes. There's one meeting and Kim Jong-il is sitting there taking notes and his assistant is telling him things and there's a speaker and the speaker keeps stopping and Kim Jong-il goes, why do you keep stopping? And he goes, well, you're, you're talking to your assistant, you're taking notes. And he says, well, I could do all these three things at once. And they said, well, from that point on, they saw that Kim Jong-il doesn't look at time as a plane, but as a cube. 
and that he has the capacity to shrink time. And my friend goes, does he mean multitasking? And yes, that is what he means. And he's apparently the only person in North Korea who's capable of doing such a thing. Um, when they were building their obelisk, you know, in, in that I mentioned earlier, the Tower of the Tree idea, uh, it was his idea to make it the tallest stone obelisk on Earth, which no one had ever considered before. So in my book, I just have this story of you imagine these architects, and, and they didn't even consider it. And they're like, let's make it the second tallest. And Kim Jong-il's the one who's be like, let's make it the tallest. And like, what a genius. It's just amazing. And there's anecdotes of these, they open an amusement park, and he's so brave because he wants to make it safe for the elderly and the kids that he rides every ride twice, even though there's a light rain, while all the people who are associated with him, his helpers, are standing there crying at his bravery. So there is a certain madness to it. And, and speaking of how their art works, I asked my mom about this. You know, I was born in the Soviet Union. Uh, Kim Jong-il hates the Mona Lisa. And I asked her, why does Kim Jong-il hate the Mona Lisa? And it took her two seconds, and she goes, because of her ambiguous smile. And that's exactly right. So according to North Korean propaganda, all art has to be completely unambiguous and completely uh, uh, clear to all the masses, which as a consequence is mind-numbingly pedantic and boring and incredibly hard to sit through, which is why so much of uh, North Korean government in current times is losing their hold on power, because as more, when, the, when the, the famine hit, those guards on the border were hungry themselves. So people would go to China, you give the border guard a cut, uh, you, now you're exposed to Chinese information, and you come back and it costs nothing to spread information, and now there's an understanding in North Korea that they're not the richest country on earth, that other countries have it far better, and this is a very, very big problem for the regime. They've allowed black markets as a means, which is not capitalism somehow, uh, in their logic, uh, which is a means to keeping people fed because the government is utterly incapable of doing so nowadays. Um, let's talk about the, you know, the contemporary things with, uh, there's a lot more to cover, obviously, but let's talk about more of the contemporary things with President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, you know, the North Koreans, when, when legends about why Kim Jong-il got the leadership position is he was sitting down with the great leader Kim Il-sung and all the generals and they said, well, what happens if the U.S. imperialists invade again? And the generals said, we'll, we'll kill him, we'll kill him, we're going to win. And the great leader Kim Il-sung says, well, what if we don't win? And they're stunned because they can't even consider such a possibility. And Kim Jong-il says, if we lose, we will destroy the world. And Kim, Kim Il-sung says, spoken like a real supreme commander. So Kim Jong-il's uh, iteration of Juche was what he called Sun Gun, which means uh, military first, which includes military eats first. And the premise is it's the military that keeps the country uh, safe and secure and allows for their freedom. Uh, it has the fourth largest military on Earth. And his idea was, in order to fight the Chinese dragon and the Russian bear and the American wolf, I have to turn North Korea into a hedgehog and by which he meant an animal with spines, missiles, going in every direction. So these claims of denuclearization have to be taken with a, a huge amount of skepticism because so much of their ideology for so long has been the US imperialists are going to invade and kill us all at any minute but for our leader. And again, they have all these uh, um, exhibits about how cruel and torturous we were during the Korean War. I don't need to tell anyone in this room how horrific war is uh, to a population. This wasn't that long ago. And then again, in the 90s, you had this famine, which was the Americans' fault. So they have a huge, uh, enormous suspicion uh, of the Americans with good reason. So it, it's a very, very um, uh, dark, obviously, situation. I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, what I am pleased with is how President Trump is realizing if you're dealing with a hostage situation, right, and this is very much a hostage situation, you have 25 million hostages, there's two types of bank robbers. There's the bank robber who runs in the bank and starts shooting up people, and there's the bank robber that runs in the bank and starts shooting up the ceiling. Now, obviously, you want to deal with the second one. This is someone who might be not respecter of property rights, but he's not a wanton mass murderer. So when North Korea fires their missiles, they're always firing them into the ocean. Uh, they're not firing them at Seoul. They're not firing them at Tokyo. This is very much by design. And one of the big arguments that people had for years, and, and thankfully has very much changed recently, is that North Korea is crazy and North Korea is suicidal. Well, if they're suicidal, how are they the last ones left? They're obviously pretty bad at being suicidal when it's just them and Cuba, when so many of these other communist states have fallen away. So uh, I, I'm going to wrap it up here. I know there's a lot more to cover because I'm running out of time, but uh, I'll have time for questions later because this is a uh
extremely complicated uh, and dark subject. But thankfully, things are getting better specifically because of information, specifically because so many people have been refugees and are in contact with people in North Korea. Uh, it used to be the world's largest consumer of VCRs. Uh, then they went to CDs, and now they use memory sticks. So one of the tricks that the North Korean government used to do is they would turn off the power in someone's house, then go inspect it. That way you can't e eject a DVD, and you could see what the people are watching. And, and God help you if it's something you know, religious, something like that. There are there's certain movies that they really like, like Titanic. Titanic sank the day that the great leader Kim Il-sung was born. That's true, which is, I suppose, a victory of communism over evil capitalism. Um, they like Jane Eyre. Uh, it, it's, it's very odd. But it's also fascinating and counterintuitive how what they do know and what they don't. For example, when I was there, I asked my guide if she knew about 9-11. And she rolled her eyes. And she's like, of course. They showed us on television, which in retrospect makes perfect sense. But I told her the fable, the Aesop's fable of the frog and the scorpion. And she didn't know what a scorpion was. I'm like, OK, it's a language barrier. And then I drew it for her. And she had no idea. She never heard of it. Because there's no scorpions in North Korea, so they don't teach them about it. right? Whereas I was thinking, how many ways do I know about scorpions? Comic books, TV shows, nature, you know, it's, it's the zodiac. So it's just fascinating when you're there, which is impossible to describe, uh, what they know and what they don't and what's allowed through. And when you're in North Korea, everywhere you look, like here, if you look in this room, you've got the clock, you've got the lights, you've got the, this, you've got the tables. Everything is there, obviously, selected for a purpose. And it, it, you don't know why it's there. You know what I mean? It's just some things are very intuitive and obvious. And some are like I, we went to this place in the middle of the highway for some reason, and there was a balcony with corn husks on it. I, to this day, have no idea what those corn husks were for, uh, what they were going to be used for. So. Um, I guess I will just wrap it up by saying, uh, and again, this is not going to be news to anyone in this room, uh, the, the best comparison of the North Korean leadership is, is the Batman villain, the Joker, in that, yes, in one very literal sense, this person is a clown, but this clown has an enormous amount of bodies behind them. And it's important to us when we're dealing with this issue to always remember the continuing plight of the North Korean people, where right now, as we speak, there's 25 million people wearing this lapel pin while they leave their house and are in constant fear uh, for their entire family being taken away at the moment's notice. Thank you.